All right, I've got an incredible show today with Jack Posobiec. We are going to be covering six or seven major stories that I think you'll be interested in. Jack, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Well, Stephen, it's been an incredible time. Just since the last time you and I have talked, I feel like so much has gone on. We've seen we've seen the primaries uh, really solidify. I kind of think end at this point. Um, we've seen Ukraine is just completely spiraling out of control so much that Vicky Newland just touched down in Kiev last night saying, saying, oh, everything is fine. Don't worry, everybody. And there's like nobody around her. And then, of course, the border is still completely open. And in Washington, D.C., it's really just become a blame game in Washington, D.C., because Biden is trying very hard. And Andrew Bates is like locked in this Twitter battle with uh, Stephen Miller saying, well, it's, it's really Trump's fault. You, the borders this way, you see, because because Trump refused to shut it down. And it's like, guys, you, you have the White House. You have the executive power. You could send the U.S. military there right now, just declare an invasion and do it. And they're still playing this weird blame game because unfortunately that problem has spilled over into the mainstream media the same way that all of these uh, third world migrant caravans are spilling over into our country. It's completely insane, but hey, we're here. Yeah, I feel like every problem the White House has that uh, they can't justify, lie about or explain, the answer always ends up blame it on Donald Trump. And I get so sick of that. I think even my Democrat family is sick of that, where they're just like, OK, listen, you've got to explain this. You've got to help me understand. You've got to justify this. <laughs> right. They can't do any of that. Boom. Just blame Donald Trump. The media will have your back and everybody goes crazy. But the rest of us who know that uh, we're being gaslit, we're sitting back going, wait, how can you blame Donald Trump? He hasn't been in office for three years like this. So. It's just it's absolute insanity. Yeah, there's kind of a grace period, basically, where, you know, I think early on in the Biden administration that Biden supporters or, or I would say Democrats in general, I don't know that many I don't know I've ever met like an actual Biden fan. Um, but, you know, the the general Democrats, the left, they said, OK, we're going to go along with this because we're so happy Trump is gone. They've got this honeymoon period, this guy. And they tried to do this whole fake relationship between him and Kamala that they were, you know, buddy, buddy, the same way that he was buddy, buddy with Obama. They tried to recreate it, even though it's completely fake. And there's there's no love loss between the two of them, which uh, James O'Keefe, of course, proved uh, and corroborated a lot of my reporting on that early on. And we'll get into that in a little bit. But there comes a point where several years on, people will start to say, you know, the world didn't seem to be spiraling out of control the way that it is right now when Trump was in office. And yeah, maybe we didn't, you know, if, if you know, if you're a Democrat, if you're an independent, you might be thinking, you know, I didn't maybe all like all of his tweets or maybe I didn't like the way that he talked to a reporter. But, you know, I was making a lot more money and gas was a lot cheaper and things didn't seem like they were blowing up and World War III wasn't on the horizon and we weren't talking about bombing Iran and going into direct war with Iran and Russia and China all at the same time, you know, that all actually had kind of seemed to be a little bit died down. And so this idea at some point, you know, people are going to realize that, you know what, the emperor has no clothes and all it's going to take is someone to point, walk up and point up and say, you know what, that 80 year old guy is walking around the White House naked and we can all see it. Yeah. <laughs> well, according to Alex Jones, that's happening anyway. So <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me. Hey, yeah. LBJ did it, too. <laughs> that, that, that's what they say. They, they found uh, Biden wandering around the White House naked a couple of times, according to Alex Jones. I, so I'll just leave it at that. Um, help me understand this, Jack. President Biden demands Republicans authorize him to give away more taxpayer money to Ukraine and other parts of the world, but won't fix our own border. For three years, he's absolutely denied there was a border crisis and said that Vice President Kamala Harris was doing an excellent job. He's now admitted there's a huge problem on the border, but he has no authority to do anything about it. This president is full of lies. Why is he so determined to completely change the direction of this country? 
Well, I think there's a there's a lot going on here. I mean, number one, and I think the most obvious for the Democrats is that they view this as a poll, a pool of new voters. Uh, they understand that their policies are not popular. They understand that their standing in the country is slipping. Uh, Joe Biden's popularity is is absolutely in the basement, just like where he ran his campaign through all of 2020. And uh, and I, I would make a joke about the laptop, but what his brother was up or his uh, son was up to in 2020. But of course, we all know about that. Um, so essentially what the Democrats are looking at in terms of this massive horde of illegal immigrants, and and I think the numbers just speak for themselves at this point, the images that have been coming across, what the Democrats are looking at is a permanent electoral majority. And they are looking at the ability to flip red states like Texas, which, and again, they've, they've publicly stated these things. Joy Ann Reed, or as I call her, Joy Ann Weave, have been saying this every single night that they are bringing people in. They want to change the electoral demographics of red states. They want to change the makeup of these states because they realize if they can't convince people to be more Democrats, then they're just going to import more Democrats, whether it be legal immigrants or illegal immigrants. They don't care. And so this has been the tete-a-tete -tete between Texas and Biden at this point because Texas is finally, my goodness, finally actually stood up and said, we're going to fight this. And Effectively, as of right now, they have done a fantastic job of shutting down the border. And Border Patrol is in an absolute vapor lock situation, or I should say the Biden administration is, because I don't I don't believe that anyone in the Border Patrol actually wants to be letting illegal immigrants in. If you talk to these guys, uh, they're they're not down for this at all. And they're actually the morale is very, very bad. But what's what's happening is, of course, they've got orders from on high to let people in to cut down the Constantina wire, et cetera, et cetera. And so what you have is a situation where they don't want to be ordered in to do it. The optics of the situation are absolutely damning for the Biden administration if they go in and start letting this go across. So Texas really has the upper hand here, has won that optics battle. I think they've done a fantastic job in terms of framing the debate because there were some people that wanted to push this into a you know civil war and state versus federal government kind of thing. But I think Texas did a very good job and Governor Abbott, and I give him credit for this, did a great job. You know, and, and I say, I say, I, I was joking. I said, I roll with Greg. You know, I roll with Greg um, that uh, that what he was able to do was frame it as an invasion of the state of Texas and use that invasion clause of the Constitution to keep it that way. And so to your point, it's not necessarily that they in their mind, they're not destroying the country in their mind. They're remaking the country in the image that they have always wanted and installing and importing now a permanent Democrat majority, whereby in, and keep in mind, this they've already done it in the state of California. We, You can go back to 1965 and look at California and look at the shifts and look at the population that's been imported into California. That was a solid red state. That was a state that that Nixon was the governor of, that Reagan was the governor of, both of which won electorally. Remember, Reagan wins California and Hawaii all the way in, in 1984, which is not that long ago, almost, what, 40 years ago. And um, yeah, 40 years this year, uh, 40 years ago, Reagan won California. Now it's the bluest of the blue state. You know, do you think that happened because Democrats were so uh, popular in California and they brought everyone? No, it's because they brought people in who vote Democrat because they know the Democrats give them free stuff. It's as simple as that. And they are trying to do this across the entire country. So maybe Biden isn't trying to ruin the country then. Maybe he's just trying to make Texas blue and he picks up all of those electoral votes and Republicans never win again because they 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 lock up another one of the bigger populated states uh, in the nation. Is that is that what you're hinting at? Exactly right. So they want to do to Texas what they did to California, what they did to Mexico. Um, Arizona, by the way, is currently on the bubble. Remember, Arizona was a red was the reddest of the red state. And then what happened? Arizona became I call it purpular. It became a purpular state. And then uh, and then because, you know, illegal immigrants, when they come to the country or, or migrants in general, uh, I think migrants is the new word. And I kind of like migrants because it, it, it it's, uh, you know, a lot of them, they say, well, they're not illegal. They're actually asylum seekers. And they say they say, well, OK, what are they seeking asylum from? Is there a war? Is there, you know, some crackdown, some oppression? They flee communism. What is it? And and no. And the Border Patrol and you'll talk to them and they say, no, these guys show up and they just say asylum, asylum. 
And it's like the one word they know in English. And once they say the word asylum, and this goes back to these ridiculous court cases that we've got, uh, not just this recent one on the Constantino wire, but that essentially says if they claim asylum or if you have probable cause that they are claiming asylum, then you must let them into the United States. Uh, and then, of course, once they get in, there's, oh, we'll schedule for a hearing in 18 months and they never show up. And now they're they're released back into the United States. Uh, they go into these underground um communities they go into uh go into working for job sites and, and by the way this this is a huge thing that i i absolutely come down on the side of um i people know i wasn't a desantis guy in the primary but you know i think desantis is 100 percent right when it comes to e-verify you've got to go to the employers if you actually crack down on the employers who hire illegal aliens which is a crime by the way i know i know it's like kind of silly that we you know, that we have to say that it's actually a crime to hire illegal aliens. If you start going after them, guess what? That flood will turn right back. Yeah. Wow. Um, okay. Let's um, actually, you know what you're saying? It, was, it reminds me of um, the uh, Pirates of the Caribbean movie where uh, Johnny Depp is uh, about to be killed and he's like, parlay, parlay. I, I, I exactly parlay, yeah. right? So as soon as you say that, even within pirate warfare, they have to shut everything down. They can't go after you. Same thing. Asylum, asylum. Uh, and then they're like, oh, he must be a, a good person. Let, let's go ahead and, and get him in. He's running from something. Uh, but we all know that uh, close to 90% of them, they're not running from anything. They just want to come to the United States because they believe that this is the land of opportunity. Um, and, and maybe it used to be. I, I saw no, it's, it and it's, it's, you know, it's economic migration. Meanwhile, my 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 wife being from uh, the former Soviet Union in uh, the Republic of Belarus, you know, she's got a sister who's never even been allowed to come to the United States, couldn't even get a visa for our wedding because she's from the wrong part of the world and tried to do it the right way and requested to come in to have my sister's getting married. I'd love to go to the wedding. Rejected, 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 overstay risk, overstay risk. And so it's it's very interesting to me that the federal government will deliberately allow people from certain parts of the world while deliberately restricting people from other parts of the world to come in. Wow. OK, let's talk about this big bombshell that came out from undercover journalist James O'Keefe. He was able to infiltrate and film himself speaking with the cybersecurity guard for the entire White House. This guy opens up that the White House does not like Kamala Harris. Uh, they would like her to be replaced, but openly admitted, if we got rid of a black woman, we would lose the black vote. We would, we would lose everything. They would go crazy. So now this guy also says that everyone in the White House is aware that Biden is slowing down and his dementia is getting out of control, but that no one is allowed to talk about it out loud. So is the Biden administration literally just covering up a president with dementia and a vice president that really nobody wants in order to retain power for their party? Yeah, there's there's so many things that came out of James's latest video, and it's incredible he got it. Um, you know, from the political aspect, clearly, uh, this this number one, uh, I would say, on the vice presidency, this corroborates a lot of reporting that we had done at Human Events Daily, um, going back almost almost three years now, where I've been I've been calling it the shade war between uh, the president and the vice president, between Biden and Harris, or so the Biden camp and the Harris camp. Uh, if you remember early on in the administration, this was getting really heated, where they would um, hand Kamala Harris these. Um, these uh, do nothing missions that they knew were going to be failures, like, oh, she's going to be in charge of the border. And if you remember back in 2022, they said that they actually said that she was going to be in charge of Ukraine <laughs> and they sent her over to the NATO conference right before Russia invaded. They say, oh, a couple of Harris has got that taken care of. Don't worry, guys. And then she wouldn't actually go to the border. She went down to, you know, some of the, um, you know, Central America, South America wouldn't go to the border itself, though. Uh, I think they put the economy on her uh, portfolio at one point. And so this was really being done because they saw Kamala Harris as angling to take Joe Biden out. Now, what would be the result of all of this? Very simple. They showed that Kamala Harris has no chops. She has no ability to operate on the main stage. She is not ready for prime time and probably never will be. Uh, so she's gotten her chance and she's lost it completely. Now, this is a huge 
Uh, this is a huge angle as well for the 2028 primary. Or, by the way, uh, if there is potentially a lottery or, as I call it, the Democrat shadow primary, of being of having someone to replace Biden, which if you notice, they do kind of talk about uh, the, the, you know, the Democrat. I noticed when uh, the staffer, when James asks him and he's in this sort of, you know, he's playing as if he's, uh, you know, like a like a grinder date kind of thing there. He's, he's, are you sure they'll both be on the ticket? You know, oh, they'll both be on the ticket. Of course, of course, he's, you know, trying to reassure himself uh, as he's reassuring James that both Biden and Kamala will be on the ticket, even though it sounds like neither of them actually want to be there. Um, so the question is, if Biden were to leave, who would replace him? I are, I've argued for a long time that that's going to follow the money flow. And of course, there are two people that are vying for the biggest pot of money in Democrat politics, this being the Silicon Valley mega billionaires. And the Silicon Valley mega billionaires, California, who are the two candidates from Cal or potential candidates from California, one of which, of course, as we know, Gavin Newsom, the other one, the former senator of California, Kamala Harris. I think that money at this point, the the easy money on that is going to say that's going to get to Gavin. They're going to look at Kamala and say, you know what? There's no way we want to prop up this dead horse candidate. We're going to go with Gavin Newsom. Now, there are some other scenarios where they could put Kamala in as a way to sort of get rid of her because they just know Trump's going to <laughs> Trump's going to sweep. So they want to just get rid of her by having her be the sort of sacrificial lamb. And that's a scenario that I could I could also get behind. But um, going back to the video, one of the other key I think elements that we receive from this, of course, hiding the fact that he he has dementia, hiding the fact that he's slowing down. Obviously, hear him admit it. But you know, I say as a former Navy intelligence officer that what you're seeing here is, you know, thank I, I would say thank God that James O'Keefe is the one who ran the sting on this guy, and thank God that this wasn't Chinese intelligence or Russian intelligence or Iranian intelligence, because what they're showing is that this is someone again, a security officer a security director at high levels of the White House. And people are saying, well, wait, why is this guy so young? Guess what? That's the average age of a White House staffer, particularly in this administration and definitely during the Obama administration as well. These are the people making the decisions. Look how susceptible to blackmail and honeypotting that guy would be because all it would take were a couple of dates and a couple of bad photos come out. And then all of a sudden you've heard about honeypot operations and how they work. And then all of a sudden for the third date, the fourth date, they show up and someone else is in the room and he's smoking a cigarette and he said oh yes yes we have the you would be very bad if these photos were published on the internet and so here's what you're going to do for us here's how and, and this is how they are able to corrupt people this is how they're able to target people the fact that james o'keefe was able to get this guy so easily went with by the way he didn't even hire anyone to do it he did it himself he did it himself with like a, you know, he just spray, you know, uh, did some like hairspray to make himself blonde and, you know, put on some eggshell glasses like John Lennon. I, li I like and, how he took off his glasses like Clark Kent. You know, was, it's like, yeah, the Clark Kent. Do you know who I am? All I had to do was put did on. you know glasses, you're on a meeting know? with James O'Keefe? Yeah, I was, I was doing a uh, an X basis with James last night and we were joking about it. And I said, did you do that on purpose? And he kind of smiled. He said, yeah, maybe. Yeah. It's like, James, yeah. we know we know you're we know you're a theatrical guy, James. You know, he does like, he likes to do his theater. So, you know, what, what it really shows to me is the fact that the Biden administration is staffed by people who are just an absolute clown show. It's an absolute circus when you're looking at any of those crises that I outlined, if you're looking at the economy right now, it's it's very clear. It's because you've got guys like this running the show in the Biden administration. That is why the Middle East is absolutely spiraling out of control. That's why Zelensky looks like he's on life support. He's hanging by a thread in Kiev right now. Uh, very susceptible to a mil military coup, by the way, extremely susceptible to a military coup in Kiev. And, and, and all of this is being done because you've got guys like that or Vicky Doolin at the top levels of the White House basically running the show. Well, again, the, you know, the old guy is just is, is, is walking around looking for the uh, looking for the creamed prunes from uh, from Jill Biden said, you know, can I get some more of a little hungry? And he goes to bed at, you know, what, 5 p.m. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was a little bit scary uh, to think, OK, uh, on the first date, you know, the, this this uh, security cyber guy, um, I'm guessing he's uh, gay. Uh, but within one day, a little bit of charming, a little bit of alcohol, he starts giving up all of the secrets yep. about the White House. The first yep. date. I mean, yeah, like this, 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 this was this shows this shows how bad it would be or how easy it would be, I would say, 
for any foreign intelligence service to walk right up to the Biden administration. You know, you hire a couple of guys like that or a couple of girls, whatever it takes. And you could you could gain immediate access to the highest levels of decision making. And quite frankly, you know, just looking at it from this perspective, you would have to say from a from a security standpoint that it's probably already happened. Right. You probably already have penetration of the Biden White House if it's simply this easy. Yeah, no, I think the penetration was over in the Senate room uh, with that uh, gay sex tape that leaked. But, but with no with no according charges, to, no charges. According to the headlines, the police aren't going to press charges just because they filmed it, just because. But they're saying because so they have can, a key card, technically they have the right to do whatever they want in that room. So you can you can go and walk peacefully around the Senate, uh, around the Capitol building, uh, a public building. And you can be arrested and thrown in jail for the rest of your life, right? If you don't do that with, again, permission, this this nebulous, did you have permission? Well, the door was open. They beckoned me in, right? I'm talking about January 6th. That's illegal. But if you film hardcore gay sex and post it on the internet and broadcast it for the world to see, that's perfectly fine and you didn't do anything wrong. And I would say that just really shows you the state of the United States government right now. Look, the, the U.S. Capitol Police was a... So here's how to understand the U.S. Capitol Police, um, because people say, wait a minute, that's law enforcement. I thought conservatives, Republicans were generally, you know, back to blue, pro law enforcement, what what gives. And but then as, as people learn more about the Capitol Police, they say, you know, this agency seems like kind of seem kind of leftist, like these seem like kind of leftist cops. What's going on here? And so what what happened was you have to understand that American politics from the 1950s all the way up until 1994, when Newt Gingrich uh, gained control of the uh, speakership, when the Republicans won this big 94 landslide, um, the entire House was controlled by Democrats for a very long time. And so the infrastructure of the Capitol during that time period was all put into place by Democrats. So you had an entire signature of you know, this this patronage system, essentially, of Democrats promoting Democrats, promoting their friends all the way up. And this is how the U.S. Capitol Police were formed at the high, again, I'm talking about the higher levels. So at the higher levels, the leadership is all Democrat, has been all Democrat. It's been this way for a very long time. And unfortunately, when the Republicans got back in in the 90s or even when they took back over in the 2000s, they never really did anything to reform that system. And so you still have this system of Democrat patronage in the U.S. Capitol Police system that's been there since since the 1990s. Wow. Interesting. OK, so let me give you let me get your thoughts on this. Um, top gambling websites are putting Representative Elise Stefanik as okay. the most likely person that Donald Trump will pick. Uh, after that is Christy Nome, Governor Christy Nome, and then former presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy. What, what are your thoughts on that? And then what are your thoughts on who Trump might actually pick? Well, I wouldn't always go with the betting sites when it comes to these things. I mean, they they once had Ron DeSantis as winning the 2024 presidential primary. We saw what happened there. So you know, it's you know, it's understandable. But let's you know, let's let's take it with a grain of salt. Um, yeah, I know Congresswoman Stefanik. I think she's fantastic. We all saw the just absolute pummeling she gave to the Ivy League um, you know, presidents and heads when they came in recently, Harvard and Penn. I think that really put her on the national map. I know President Trump obviously watched that. And and more importantly, it's not to say that he watched the hearing because anyone can have, you know, this Mark Zuckerberg was up yesterday and he had a, you know, this this fiery grilling from the Senate. But the real question is, okay, you have a fiery grilling at the Senate, you have a fiery hearing, that's great, but, but what came of it? Did anything actually happen? Well, you know something, President of, of Harvard had to step down and the president of Penn had to step down, which is a place that, of course, President Trump is the, and, uh, he is a Penn alumnus. He went to Wharton. And so I think he saw the fact that she got results. Okay, she absolutely got results with what she did there, and uh, some of the obviously most prestigious and powerful institutions in in the country, possibly the world, um, and that she was able to that she was able to do that. So I think that's something that really propelled her to the highest ranks of this, and the fact that she's you know just generally been a strong Trump supporter, a strong America First Congresswoman in. Um, in general during the time that she's been in office. So I would I would I would certainly say you can't have a conversation without her. Um Vivek Ramaswamy, of course, this idea that, you know, he he ran for president and 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 people say, okay, well he only got seven percent. He's a failed candidate. And I say, 
he went from nothing, right? He went from zero to hero, right? You know, zero to seven is much harder than going and, you know, take a Ron DeSantis. He had been, you know, he was a congressman and then he was a governor and then he was running. So he's got a long history of being this, you know, this typical career politician kind of track that you see uh, running for president. And so he gets, you know, he ends up with about 12%. Nikki Haley, again, uh, also a governor, had a national position as the UN ambassador. She gets about 11%. And so, you know, they followed those sort of typical career politician tracks. Vivek Ramaswamy comes literally out of nowhere and gets 7% all by himself. I think that's a tremendous feat. And so <clears throat> I think that plus the fact that when he first came out, you know, I think he was just kind of, you know, was kind of, you know, feeling him feeling out the room, figuring out what was going to happen. But then somewhere along the way, you know, he started learning more about how the, the system works and how just how corrupt politics is in America today. And he just became this. He got based. I don't know. He got red pilled, I guess you would say, uh, as the kids say. And so I think that new version of Vivek 2.0 uh, was very formidable and someone who I, I definitely would say is in the running. I wouldn't say that he's he's first, but I say you can't have the conversation without him. Um, Ron DeSantis. So people, a lot of people say, and a lot of the the DeSantis supporters, people in that camp, uh, you're you're hearing these trial balloons saying, "Hey, wait a minute, this guy, he's the governor of a state, uh, very successful governor. He was your biggest rival. Um, you have the opportunity to, you know, to pick him up. Potentially, he could help you in the suburbs. He could help you with some of these um, areas that you need help with. And so, I, I see on paper why that might make sense, but I just think there's so much bad blood." between the two sides there and the fact that he took $130 million just on the super PAC side, not even for his own campaign, $130 million that could have been used to target uh, voters in the fall, $130 million that could have been used for these ballot, uh, you know, ballot harp. People say I'm not allowed to say ballot harvesting because some of the states you can't ballot harvest. So ballot chasing, ballot harvesting, ballot contact, whatever you want to call it, right? Ballot operations in the fall that regardless of who the candidate is, that money could have gone to. And so, look, I, I, I think that because of that, and because DeSantis continues to criticize Trump, even after he's already left the race and endorsed him, I just don't see it happening. I really don't see it happening. Um, and then you mentioned Christy Nome as well. Um, which is possibility. I would say possibility. I think, you know, there's a there's a there's a <laughs> there's a phrase in pro pro wrestling. And I'm, a, I'm a, you know, I used to watch a lot of pro wrestling when I grew up. And there's a lot of pro wrestling terms that they came up with that are useful for politics. And you, you, if she were a pro wrestler, you would say she's, yeah, she's good, but she's not over. You know, she hasn't, she hasn't beaten anyone yet. She hasn't, she hasn't had some big victory to get her over with the audience. You know, nobody's really coming out cheering Christy, no, Christy. It's just, it's just not there. There's something that's not quite been there yet. And there were a few times where she had opportunities like standing up against this trans bill uh, that was being passed in the South Dakota legislature. And she refused. She refused to stand up against that bill. And she went on Tucker Carlson and all that. And so people have seen these opportunities to say, well, you know, is Christy Nome really the kind of fighter that we want? And I like Christy Nome. I think she's I think she's a good person. But again, you know, we're talking about someone who, number one, if you're going to be the vice president under Donald Trump, remember, because he's term limited under the U.S. Constitution, he cannot run again. That means whoever gets this spot is going to be in position essentially to be the you know kind of heir apparent to the America First U movement, the MAGA movement, and everyone understands this. So there's really two options. Do you go with some, and this is where I kind of come in, do you go with somebody who's, you know, who's ambitious, that wants to be the next, you know, the new leader of the party, or do you go with someone who's not ambitious and just wants to tear the place completely down? <laughs> And I, I think that's actually the more fun answer. And so when I look at someone like that, I would say I that's what, you know, I've, I've said this publicly a few times, uh, like a Rand Paul, put him on the ticket, you know, really just go after the administrative state. Or if you're looking at it from a geographical standpoint, you know, who's sort of the, you know, who's that fire in the belly wants to take it to the administrative state individual of the Midwest, I would say Ron Johnson, the the senator of Wisconsin, who, by the way, won Wisconsin uh, in 2022, so has shown that he's able to win in the Rust Belt, and absolutely someone who is not uh, who is not going to take anything that the administrative state or the legislature says publicly, and a guy who's been, you know, if you've been watching this border bill, has been absolutely um, just an absolute champion for the American in 
interest and not afraid to call out Langford or call out McConnell on this. And so, you know, I, th I think he grew that beard and somehow he just got, uh, you know, it just it gave him superpowers. And I, I think that might be, I don't know, Stephen, maybe you consider it. Yeah, um, I, I really like <laughs> Bake. Um, you know, people were worried that he was a plant, a George Soros um you know, funded person. I kept doing my research and after watching him and researching him, I ended up interviewing him three different times. Um, I think he's the real deal. I think he's incredibly intelligent. I also like the idea of a Trump Tucker Carlson ticket. I think oh, wouldn't uh, that be wonderful. Oh, but I don't know if Tucker wants to give up his. Well, new so I had Tucker, I had Tucker on the show on human events and we did we did a huge interview at a, you know viral and all that and I, I kept kind of poking him about it during the during the interview and I and, and the way that you know when I asked him basically do you want to do it and he said ah, I don't know you know I've never done anything like that where he gave his kind of static answer so then I then I tried um I tried running an angle on him and I I, I spent some time in the uh interrogation cell at Guantanamo so they they teach you running angles and uh, and the angle I said was oh, okay. Well, you'd be fine if Nikki Haley was on the ticket to be <laughs> President Trump. And he, he just stops. He just stops cold. He looks at me and goes, "Excuse me, <laughs> excuse me, Nikki." I said, "Well, Tucker, if it's not you, he's probably going to choose Nikki Haley." So, and he's like, are, are, you're, "They're not serious. People aren't actually." No, <laughs> no, that can't happen. So you know, maybe that's maybe that's a way to get you know talk him into it. Oh my gosh, that was a gangster move to catch him off guard. Well, Jack, thank you so much for coming on, discussing these big topics. Um, I really appreciate it. If people want to follow you, stay in the loop, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, of course. Human Events Daily. We're there uh, an hour every day. So 2 to 3 p.m. Real America's Voice. We come on right after Bannon and Charlie Kirk. I uh, put the podcast out, Rumble, YouTube, et cetera, as well. And then, of course, people know I occasionally uh post on x i go viral every once in a while when apparently i have all the swifties very upset at me and the media is very upset about all that and i don't know what it was i just posted a couple tweets that said it looks like they're going to use her against trump in the in the uh in the fall and the entire mainstream media is losing their minds at me right now so i've got joy and weave i've got and i've got cnn i've got james carville it's 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 really amazing yeah, leave, leave her alone. She's a sweet, a sweet person. You know, I actually, I don't mind her music. Um, you know, I'm sure our political beliefs are very different. But I didn't say anything about her music. That was the craziest part. <laughs> I was like, I was like, they're just going to use her to, to harvest votes in the in the fall. That's all I said. And it's like, oh, they're and they're clearly setting this up with the Time magazine, and then the, the now the Super Bowl on top of that, and the romance. Yeah. I was like, my goodness, they're going to flip a switch in the fall, get get the Swifty vote out for Biden, and it's it's clearly going to be something they're going to do in the swing states. All I said, and boy. Wow. What can I what can I say? I really must have kicked over a hoarder's nest with that one. Yeah. The one thing that I did read is that she may not want to connect herself to Biden right now because uh, he and many of the top Democrat leader, they're getting so much pushback about all the people being killed in Gaza that she may not want to link her brand. Well, this is a huge issue that Biden has right now, right? Because one of the main reasons that Biden is losing so badly with Gen Z, as well as with uh, Muslim American voters in states like Michigan, Minnesota, and Virginia, obviously Minnesota, Ilhan Omar gives this, this speech. And I think a lot of conservatives saw that speech and said, oh, I can't stand Ilhan Omar, blah, blah, blah. I said, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. You guys don't understand, she's giving an anti-Biden speech, right? Because she's attacking the policies of her own side. So the squad is totally against Biden at this point. And they've got all of Gen Z through TikTok, you know, totally against Israel. And so I, I, to your point, right, this is why it's to the Bidens. Um, it would be very smart politics for them if they could get Taylor Swift on board. And I think if you're the Democrats right now, why wouldn't you be thinking this way? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. We'll see how it all works out. Thank you so much. I hope you have a great rest of your day. God bless, man.